welcome. It's good to be back. How's everybody doing? It? Celebrations today, anniversaries, grandchildren, birthdays. Barbara's. I was just asked, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a birthday. Any other birthday, Karen? Nancy's birthday on Wednesday. Oh, Nancy! <laughs> I don't count them anymore. <laughs> That's all right. We can still celebrate them. <laughs> celebrate that you're here. Awesome. All right. Oh, the way! Congratulations! How was the competition? We won half a point. There we go. Get in there, Doug. Get in. Well done. Well done. We do have your birthday to Barbara and Nancy. So we are a growing community, and in a growing community, there's a growing need for support. And so our weekly visitors are doing a wonderful job of supporting people, especially those who are housebound or just need help to, to talk to somebody. But we need more of that. We're looking for other people who want to learn how to support those in a pastoral way, bringing God into their lives and helping them know that this community cares for them. Over Lent, I'll be offering a pastoral care course to help you learn how to do that, or even just to care for your own loved ones, how to bring God into the conversation and be with Him in a peaceful, loving way. Not that you aren't doing it already, but maybe we can give you some pointers. Because this is an unusual Lenten, Lenten um, education Lenten course, I'm also recommending for those who don't want to look after care that the United Church Canada is offering one on uh, the, excuse me, spiritual practices for climate and crisis. It looks like a wonderful course. It's going to be online on Tuesday. So check the weekly update for any details on how to register for that. So please see me if you want to do the Pastoral Care course. Please see the weekly update if you'd like to do the spiritual practices for a climate in crisis. And Joan. Good morning. Um, I'm just coming down from our big trivia win. <laughs> anyway, um, a couple of things that have come to my attention. I am the chair of outreach and social action here, um, and one of the main things we do is support the Magic Food Cover. And at Christmas, we get a lot of food. And uh, even though we moved to a new location, there isn't enough room there to store this, the uh, bounty that we get at Christmas. So if you go into what was previously known as the choir room, there are boxes and bags of food, and that's the overflow storage, it will slowly disappear between now and I predict uh, by the end of April it will all be gone. So if you're curious about that, uh, um, that's what that is. And oh, I, I've gotten so I don't write things down anymore and clearly there was a second thing I wanted to say and I've forgotten. Oh, I know. Uh, I know. Paul said I had 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as in the past couple of years, we've had a Lenten calendar, which, uh, if you really stretch the idea of reflection, it, it is a, a form of reflection during Lenten. This year, we're going to be supporting Water First, 
we had a lot of water calendar in 2022, and it has been revised. We didn't just pull out the old one and skip those because because facts facts have changed. So uh, we will have the water calendar available uh, as an attachment to the weekly update. We'll have some hard copies. It, it gives you a daily prompt to ask you to think about water usage and water um, uh, advisories that exist on in, in Indigenous communities. And with the with each prompt, there's a little. Sometimes there's a tax that has to be paid. So if you have so many uh, bottles of bottled water in your house, you might have to pay 10 cents for each bottle that you have. So we raise a little bit of money and that will be donated to Water First. So that's that's the other thing. Thank you, So I also want to talk about Black History Month. Uh, as most of you probably know, February in Canada, we acknowledge Black History Month and try to recognize the contributions and the struggles that our black communities have had and had over the last few centuries. So I'm going to read a short text. In 2020, the United Church of Canada responded to the Black Lives Matter movement and started a reflection process on racism in our society and in our church. One of the results of that reflection was that the United Church of Canada decided not only to welcome all people, but to actively work against racism. And so we are becoming an anti-racist denomination. What does that actually mean? Well, I'm still trying to figure it out, but this is the definition that we're working with. An anti-racist denomination is one that actively works at dismantling racism and white supremacy at all levels in the church, continues to work at decolonizing its theology, and strives to redistribute racial power more fairly. It does this anti-racism work so that people from all racial backgrounds can participate in the church's life fully and freely. So at this point in our journey to becoming an anti-racist church, we have a working group at the national office and they host education and discussion groups about how we can take positive and active uh, choices to fight racism, not only in our society, but also within our church, because it does still exist in our church. Surprising as that may be, there is still racism in the United Church of Canada. It's going to take a long time, but we are going to get there. We are determined. Life in God is constantly changing and growing. And so changes like this are wonderful news. Because it's one more way that we can progress to that kingdom of heaven. Let's start with our century. I certainly need this after being away for so long, so excuse me if I take some time to be with God. If you're comfortable, close your eyes. Take a deep breath in and out and know that God is here. Take a deep breath in and out and know that you are safe here. Take a deep breath in and out and know that you are where you are meant to be. Please join in our land in our land acknowledgement. We are gathered on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. As part of our commitment to reconciliation with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, we support the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission Call of Elections. We call on all levels of government in collaboration with Aboriginal people to create adequately funded and accessible Aboriginal-specific victim programs and services with appropriate evaluation mechanisms. A big moment, but it's a recognition that we need to have victim services that fit the Indigenous people who have been hurt. We're getting there. Let us light our Christ candle. We light this Christ candle in our love for God, our love for Christ, and our love for the Holy Spirit. 
May the light of this candle remind us of the strength found in God. May the light of this candle remind us of the truth found in Christ. And may the light of this candle remind us of the Holy Spirit that fills us, connects us, unites us, and gives us life. Please join in our call to worship. God has invited us to come. So we have. God has spoken to the world. So we have. God has given us glimpses of grace and mercy. So we wait long for healing, eager for hope. God has been faithful to all generations. So we offer our praise to God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Let us start with our opening hymn. Here we are to worship. <clears throat> This is the steeple. 
open the doors, and there are all the people. And that's what makes church the people like you. And you do it without help. You got it? What's this? Say it with me. This is the church. This is the steeple. Open the door. And there's all the people. Awesome. You're good. You got it. <laughs> all right. Let's say our prayer before we go down and have some fun. Day by day, dear God, these three things I pray. To see you more clearly. Love you more dearly. Follow you more dearly. Amen. And we're going to sing a song about being a church. Next one. We are a church. Delighting in all that we have seen, heard, and known, we worship you, one God, creator, Christ, and spirit, holy and loving, now and always. Please join in our confession of prayer. Creator God, source of love and mercy, we confess that we're often so busy, we overlook those we love, including you. Sometimes we think we're so busy, we make excuses to avoid important commitments. Sometimes we make ourselves busy and neglect you. Forgive us. Calm our minds and hearts so that we can make loving you and others our priority. Amen. It's true that we sin when we don't love as God commands us. But it's a greater truth, and it's a fundamental truth, that God will always forgive us. Be at peace with God. Forgive yourself. Forgive one another. 
May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment to share the peace of Christ with all those around you in a safe manner. <laughs> Holy God, by your Spirit, make these ancient stories and words come alive for us. Help us to see them both in ourselves and those we encounter each and every day. Open us to your will for our lives and through the stories of those who lived long ago. Amen. Amen. And I invite Hilda to come forward with our reading. First scripture this morning is from Psalm 147, verses 1 to 11. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcasts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor is nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. Thank you, Hilda. Usually we give you the traumatic reading, so I'm glad you guys did one today. <laughs> <laughs> Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, and our actual will be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord and Savior. So over the last few weeks, we once again heard the stories of Jesus' baptism and birth, obviously, and his preparation for ministry, including calling the disciples. But now, today, we get down to business. The business of Jesus' ministry. That ministry of helping everyone know God's everlasting love. That ministry of healing and teaching people to care for each other and for creation. Jesus' ministry of preparing his disciples and all of his followers to come together in hope and peace and joy and love to help usher that world that God calls us to. But we're still at the very beginning of that story. Day one, 
of Jesus' three-year ministry started in the town called Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. At that time, about 1,500 people lived in that fishing village. And Jesus started his ministry by teaching in a synagogue and healing a man who had been possessed by an unclean spirit. After witnessing that healing and that power, Simon took Jesus to his home so he could heal his mother-in-law. His mother-in-law had a fever and was in bed. Now, 2,000 years ago, being sick in bed with a fever was a lot more serious than it is today. Obviously, they didn't have the medications nor the tools to determine why the fever was happening. The other problem was that many people believed that anyone who was sick was being punished by God for something that they or even their ancestors may have done. So sick people were often ostracized from their families and their communities. We talked about that a lot. And one of Jesus' recurring messages is that sick people are always, always beloved children of God and should be supported and should be cared for by all those around them. Jesus' response to Simon's request was simple, and it was profound. Jesus took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her. Nothing dramatic. No fanfare. Jesus reached out, took her hand. Jesus touched her, and that's all it took. Most of the times when Jesus healed someone in the Gospels, it was through a touch. Jesus healed a man with leprosy when he touched him. <coughs> Jesus touched children and blind people and deaf people and crippled people and the servant whose ear was cut off at Gethsemane. And he healed them. When it's welcome, a compassionate touch creates relationship and connection. And you all know this. And when we're learning pastoral care in seminary, we're taught that with permission to include a gentle touch on the shoulder or hold hands with those that we're caring for. None of us have Jesus' power of healing, but that touch still has huge healing power. And while it's not as prevalent in Scripture, it is mentioned, but not as often, I am a huge proponent of the healing power of a hug, and there are several people in this congregation that we have read, I have to read with a hug, because that's our practice. Right, Larry? Great. Unfortunately, the last few years of pandemic has left us a little afraid to touch and to hug, and granted, we do need to be cautious, but I do hope that that practice of touching and hugging can return so we can bring that healing power back to our community. So after that encounter with Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus' evening suddenly became really busy. Now, now Hebrew scripture did not allow, did not permit healing during the Sabbath day. Something else Jesus would do later on. But as soon as the sun went down that day, crowds of people came for his healing touch. And we heard in Mark 1, verse 33, the whole city gathered around the door while he healed. And then in the morning, it was still dark. Jesus got up, he went out, and he prayed. And afterwards, he and the disciples walked through Galilee, repeating that same pattern, that pattern of the first day, again and again and again. Teach, heal, and then go rest and pray. It's a pattern he repeated the rest of his ministry. Jesus, the Son of God, the person who performed miracles in God's name, who walked countless kilometers showing God's love to the world, Jesus made sure that he rested and prayed on a regular basis. Jesus made sure to care for himself so that he could continue caring for others. And as I go around the community, I speak to almost as many caregivers as I do people who need care. And the one thing I see again and again is caregivers forgetting that they need rest 
too. If you want to be able to continue caring for your loved ones, caregivers need rest just like Jesus. No matter how much we love someone or how much they need us, we still need our regular rest, just like Jesus did, if we want to continue serving. So as with many of you here, I've had a lot of challenges in my life. And there are a lot of people in my life who need my support. Last week was particularly hurt. But I've learned the hard way that I can't care for you. I can't care for others. I can't care for those I love unless I care for myself. You know, I love being renewed in the forest and the trees and the water. I'm also a huge fan of yoga and meditation. But the place where I can rest and recover best is right here, in this community. Spending time with God and with the people I love while we pray and sing and connect is the best healing that I know. It's where I revive. And yes, this may also be a place where I'm called to serve and care for others, but thanks to God's blessings, this is also where I come to be healed and where I can recover. I believe that many of you feel exactly the same way. And you come here week after week, not only to connect with God, but to connect with the others that you love. You come here to care for others and to receive that care. You come here to rest and renew so that you're better prepared to go out into that snowy world. You come here to rest and pray after a hard week, just like Jesus did throughout his ministry. Just like Jesus. And so as followers of Christ, we want to live as Jesus showed us. And Jesus showed us on that very first day in Capernaum, and he repeated that same cycle day after day after day throughout his ministry. Teach. Heal and then go away and rest and pray. He went out into the world to help people know and understand God's love. He healed others with his words and his touch, and then he rested. And he prayed on a regular basis so we could do it all over again. So if you really want to live the way Jesus taught us, that's the way. Go out in your lives and your worlds helping others know God's love Care for others, and then please care for yourselves. Rest and pray. If you want to live as Jesus taught, I pray that this is a place where you can also make that dream come true. This is a place where you can care for others and feel cared for. Maybe this is a place where you can teach and learn, heal and be healed. Love and be loved. May this be a place where you find inspiration and renewal that you need to live the rest of your lives just as Jesus taught us. May you be blessed in this place just as I am. Amen. Let us sing about healing problems like a healing stream.
And in recognition of Black History Month, I'd like to use a prayer written by Dr. Elaine Smith in honor of Black History Month. God of peace, you give us courage and strength and perseverance needed to challenge the systems of racism so that we can clear a path for your justice, peace, and equity. We believe racism is present in our society and in our church. And throughout time has manifested itself in many forms and in varying degrees. We know racism is alive in our language, in our structures, and through our system it actively works to deconstruct your glorious design, blocking the path to justice, equity, and peace that Jesus brought. Racism exists. And it challenges the gospel message that we cry. We cry abundant life for all, knowing that we are slowly being suffocated by the pervasive evil of racism. Some of us are choking. Some of us cannot breathe. Some of us are dead. We cry peace, knowing that we are the instruments of God's peace, and that such peace cannot exist without justice, equity, compassion, and God's grace. We cry, Emmanuel, God with us, knowing that to God every life matters. God is with all people. Even though as a community and a society we have stated to our actions that some lives matter more than some others, compassion one, help us understand how racism finds life in our hearts and in our country. And in this time of tense anticipation, we may we commit ourselves to be the people of your way, crying and creating a path for justice, equity, and peace for all people in this wilderness of hatred and racism. Dear God, we bring unto our minds and to our prayers, we offer to you the names of those people nearest and dearest to our hearts, praying that you are with them and that they know your love this day. We pray for Carol. As her world disappears, may she always know your love 
May she always know that she is cared for and supported. May she know peace. We pray for Marilyn. May she remain connected to this community, even if she can't be physically present. May she know God's love. We pray for Diane. May she be with you every moment. We pray for Troy. May Troy gain strength from your support and from the power of the Holy Spirit around them. We pray for Eric. We pray for Aileen and Jim. May they know your peace. May they know that their community of Manfred United continues to pray and support them and call out for their help. We pray for Barbara. Dear Lord, may Barbara know your love. May Barbara know the peace that comes from having the Holy Spirit run through her. And dear Lord, I pray for Michael this morning. May you bring him healing. May you bring him strength. Gracious God, we offer these prayers to you and continue to pray in the way that Jesus taught Our mother and mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, Please rise and join our closing hymn, The Servant Song, also called We Are Pilgrims.
tough homework assignment this week. Rest, find peace, recover, take care of yourselves. God bless you.